Good morning and welcome to all of you. I am very pleased to have you attending our ATLIS Action webinar. My name is Lorena Hernandez. I work as a project officer at the Joint Research Center of the European Commission for the European Location Interoperability Solutions for a Government Action, better known for its acronym ELISE. For the benefit of those who are new to the ELISE Action, it is worth saying that ELISE is one of the 54 actions funded uh, by the ISA Square program. ISA Square is a European interoperability program aiming at providing cross-border and cross-sector interoperability solutions for public administrations, businesses, and citizens. In this sense, what makes it special is that it is the only action focusing on the location dimension as a driver for enabling the digital government transformation. Within the context of the ELISA knowledge transfer activities, we are organizing periodical webinars. The purpose of these events is actually to engage in an agile way the topics of relevance to the digital transformation by harnessing the use of special data and technology. You can find all the webinars, including the current one, uh, in our join up page. The topic that brings us here today are the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. This is a challenging topic that requires each of us to take action to be overcome. We can surely help as an average person by introducing sustainable routines in our daily life, such as turning off the lights when not needed, recycling, taking short showers, among many others. But we can contribute even more from our professional and academic spheres. And in this regard, we think that the special data, special technology and special thinking in general can be of great help to know where and why things happen. And this is exactly the message that we want to convey today through this webinar. To this purpose, we have today with us Martina Barbero and Lea Itreus from Deloitte Belgium, who together with the JRC and Q11 have carried out the research for this webinar. For the presentation, they will start by setting the scene, highlighting right away the link between geospatial and the SDGs. Next, they will focus on our two main topics for today. On the first hand, they will underline the need to strengthen the collaboration in order to create rich and diverse data ecosystems. And on the second hand, they will focus on what location intelligence is and how it is already helping both in monitoring and implementing the SDGs. To finalize, they will point out some of the challenges that still remain. I wish you a pleasant webinar, and without more delay, I hand over to Martina. Thank you very much, Lorena, for this nice introduction, and thank you very much to all the people that joined today. So we would like to start with this webinar and this presentation with a quote from Anna Wellenstein, the Director of Land and Geospatial at the World Bank. She recently stated that high-quality, timely geospatial information is often overlooked in policymaking, yet fundamental to achieving inclusive growth and sustainable development. So this is the topic that we will um, cover today, the role that geospatial information and particularly geospatial data ecosystem and location intelligence can play in achieving the sustainable development goals. So the sustainable development goals are actually um, uh, have been adopted in 2015 by United Nations uh, with the idea of providing a shared blueprint for a more sustainable future. Uh, the Agenda for the Sustainable Development 2030 includes 169 targets and 17 sustainable development goals. These goals are meant to be as an urgent call for action by all countries, both developed and developing, in a global partnership. So the question of global partnership is really a key word in the context of sustainable development and of the SDG, because it constitutes one of the five pillars for realizing these goals. It can be imagined that for achieving such ambitious goals, uh, there is a requirement for different sectors and actors working together in an integrated manner by pulling resources, knowledge and expertise across border. So global partnership is really pivotal for sustainable development goals. And it's also pivotal to recognize uh, that a number of lessons learned were derived by the experience of implementing the Millennium Goals, which were the predecessors of the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, and in particular, we looked at the literature concerning the Millennium Development Goals uh, to identify what were the key uh, tools and key trends uh, that uh, were recognized as essential for achieving sustainable development. And the literature identifies Three, and the literature highlights in particular three key terms. Terms like participatory synergies, intel linkages, collaboration are really a constant in recent literature uh, discussing the successful delivery of the sustainable development goals. These terms are widely understood, uh, but they generally encompass collaboration between different types of actors, actors, including, for instance, government, NGOs, universities, private sector, and more recently also citizens. 
The role of technology for achieving the sustainable development goals is also widely covered by the literature. Uh, however, in the past, technology narrative was more shaped in terms of technology transfer from less developed, from more developed to less developed nations. Uh, nonetheless, the role of technology goes well beyond that. Today, we, we talk about global innovation system, consciously connecting regions across the globe, linking actors in research society and facilitating co-production and transfer of locally appropriate knowledge and technology. So actually, the successful use of technology for sustainable development goals is more and more linked to the collaboration between players and the question of ecosystems. Finally, the availability and reliability of data for successful development is a topic that, brought, uh, that drew a lot of attention in the past, and in particular from the angle of monitoring and, and, and data for uh, monitoring and reporting. Uh, in general, this academic debate stresses the need to conceptualize and operationalize the targets with focus on the indicator's relevance and exposes the need for data. Data availability has always been a hot topic, and especially in the context of the Millennium Goals, uh, and the non-availability and reliability of data were most often reported as key challenges in achieving those. Um, so, the role of data is undisputed, uh, is undisputed uh, as uh, in terms of importance for sustainable development, um, and um, we believe that. Uh, this role is uh, is gaining more and more attention uh, because data is not only now considered from the perspective of monitoring and reporting, but for uh, a wider perspective and its role in terms of policy making. If we now go to the next slide, we can see a very nice mapping exercise that has been done by Eurostat uh, and, and is looking at the role of geospatial data for the different sustainable uh, goals and 169 targets. Uh, there's a lot of literature, literature and ongoing initiatives on the role of geospatial. This is just one example, um, but uh, it shows very well the importance of geospatial information for sustainable development and in the context of the SDG. Of course, uh, there are some uh, uh, goals that are more of, well, of course, geospatial information is more important from some goals and targets than for others. As the picture shows, for instance, uh, sustainable, goal, uh, sustainable Development Goals 11, which is Sustainable Cities and Communities, and Sustainable Development Goals 15, Life on Land, are two for which geospatial data really plays a pivotal role. So this question of uh, role of geospatial data for sustainable development is something on which many different players and organizations are, are, have been working quite, uh, quite extensively in the past. One of the organizations working the most on this topic is the UNGGIM, which is the United Nat Nations Committee of Experts on Global Geospatial Information Management. Uh, and it's, it's a working group aiming to address global challenges regarding the use of geospatial information, including in, in the context of the development agendas. Uh, there are two initiatives at the global UNGJM level that we would like to highlight here. Uh, the first is the establishment of an interagency and expert group on the sustainable development goal indicators. So this is really a group providing expertise and advice on how geospatial data, heard observation, and other new data sources um, can contribute to the production and dissemination of the indicators related to sustainable development. But there is also a very nice uh, uh, recurrent publication, uh, which is on the future trends in geospatial information and management, uh, that really pinpoints at what's going on in terms of geospatial and what are the uh, future trends and technology to, to look at. And you see here listed some of the key um, points of attention uh, to which the publication uh, to which the, uh, which publication looks. So the question of smart cities and IoT, big data, artificial intelligence, etc. Uh, it's particularly important to mention here the publication also highlights the role of heard observation and satellite data for complementing traditional geospatial sources. Uh, the reason why we mention it here is because this topic uh, will be uh, touched upon in in other parts of this presentation and is becoming increasingly important. So UNGJM works a lot at the global level, but also in Europe. So the UNGJM Europe work includes two very interesting publications from last year, 2019. Uh, one is a report on the territorial dimension of SDG indicators that really looks uh, at um, how statistical information can be can be used in the content of uh, sorry how uh, statistical and geospatial data can be used in the context of sdg and touches upon a number of key themes 
uh, such as the harmonization of data, the use of third observation data, which we just mentioned, and the need for increased collaboration between players. And in parallel to this publication, the UNJM Europe also worked on a call for political action in Europe uh, that is really aimed uh, at encouraging member states to increase communication between stakeholders, strengthening institution and governance, and, and work on standards, quality, and accessibility of data. So a lot of interesting material has been published uh, by the UNGGAM. But the UNGJM is not the only organization, of course, working on the role of geospatial for, uh, for sustainable development goals. For instance, when we look from the angle of Earth observation, uh, we see that uh, associations such as the European Association of Remote Sensing Companies have also been carrying out mapping exercises similar to what Eurostat did to see where Earth observation data can complement geospatial data and help achieving the sustainable development goals. Uh, we will not be very long in describing this initiative, but just to say that they have mapped, for instance, uh, the relevance of third observation data for sustainable development goals uh, six on clean water and sanitation, and the first for the specific targets and indicators mentioned there. It's also uh, interesting to, uh, to, to mention here that the European Association of Remote Sensing Company has also uh, promoted a product award, uh, which is given to a product supporting and contributing to sustainable development projects or implementation of the sustainable development goals at the national, regional and local level. So here again, uh, a lot of work uh, going into looking at the role of geospatial and heritage observation data in this case for sustainable development. Um, and this brings us to our next slide. So the, the, there's relation between geospatial and sustainable development goals is, uh, is a long-standing relationship and the role of geospatial for monitoring indicators is widely acknowledged. However, we will argue that geospatial can play a role also in the delivery of the sustainable development goals. Um, and if we look not only at monitoring and reporting, but also at the delivery of the policies, there are two increasingly important dimensions that stand out. The first is the role of new emerging data ecosystem and partnerships for the provision of data for development. Um, so we have seen how global partnership is a key word in the context of the delivery of the sustainable development goals. And in the course of this webinar, we will speak about data ecosystem as a form of partnership. And the second aspect that is increasingly important is, the, import, is the, the, the aspect of location intelligence in the context of data ecosystem and for the delivery of sustainable development goals. So the next uh, slides uh, look at defining this concept before we go into the different examples of how they are put in practice starting with uh, the definition of data ecosystem, uh, which is a term that is more and more widely used, and there are many definitions around. Uh, for the purpose of this webinar, we took one, uh, which is a definition from Oliveira and Losho from 2018. Uh, in, in their definition, data ecosystem are composed of complex networks of organization and individuals that exchange and use data as main resource. This ecosystem provides an environment for creating, managing, and sustaining data sharing initiatives, such as smart cities, open data, and scientific data communities. So based on this definition and comparing when we compare it to the transnational multi-stakeholder partnership definition, which are institutionalized transboundary interaction between public and private actors aiming at the provision of collective goods. If we compare this to definition, we can actually argue that uh, data being a collective good, data ecosystem can fit the definition of transnational multi-stakeholder partnership, which are then recognizes pivotal in its SDG literature. So one could argue that data ecosystems are nothing more than a specific type of partnership which aims at delivering a specific public good, meaning data, and transform it in intelligence. And this leads us to the definition of location intelligence, which is also pivotal in the context of this webinar. The term location intelligence comes from the IT literature mainly and refers to a business intelligence tool capability that relates uh, geographic context to business data. So there are again a lot of definitions of location intelligence and most of these definitions are really IT oriented. Um, for the purpose of this webinar we would like to interpret location intelligence in a, in a bit of a broader way encompassing both the processes so the technologies like GIS, but also artificial intelligence, digital twins, etc. that allow to turn input 
meaning data, including traditional geospatial sources, but also more innovative sources, into outputs. So insights allowing for uh, making a decision on sustainable development goals and uh, more geospatially better and more geospatially aware. So we would like to uh, take this broader concept and broader definition uh, as a working definition for this webinar. Um, so so that we can encompass these different aspects and really give example of how location intelligence in practice can support sustainable development goals. And on this note, I would like to leave the floor to my colleague, Lea. Thank you very much, Martina, for, uh, for this uh, introduction. Um, so indeed, we will now uh, move into the first main section of this webinar, which is on partnerships and ecosystems as enablers for sustainable development. Um, now, as explored in the previous section, we saw that transnational multi-stakeholder partnerships um, can indeed be tied to the definition of data ecosystems. So, partnerships being sort of a necessary enabler for the global scope of the SDGs also constitutes uh, indeed a separate goal. So, according to the UN Sustainable Development definition, uh, partnerships for sustainable development are multi-stakeholder initiatives voluntarily undertaken by governments, intergovernmental organizations, major groups, and other stakeholders with efforts are contributing to the implementation of intergovernmentally agreed development goals and commitments. So sustainable development goal number 17 which, as we know, aims to strengthen the means of implementation and revitalize the global partnership for sustainable development, recognizes multi-stakeholder partnerships as important vehicles um, for mobilizing and sharing knowledge, expertise, uh, technology, and uh, financial resources to support the achievement of the sustainable development goal in all countries, and of course, uh, particularly developing countries. So importantly as well, Goal 17 also seeks to encourage and promote effective public, public, par uh, private and civil society partnerships, building on the experience and resourcing strategies of partnerships. Uh, so ecosystems as a form of a partnership can therefore be an effective tool to achieve SDG 17. So to understand why we're bringing together all of these dimensions, we thought that this quote by Aditya Agrawal, who's the Director of Data Ecosystems Development at the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data was quite covering. So he says that it is time to bring together official national statistical data along with geospatial data, earth observation data and citizen generated data and big data that more real-time data is available to address the SDGs. This will only help in both reporting and monitoring purposes and what it means for data for action and decision making. So how we'd like to bring this all together is to say that in um, exploring data ecosystems and partnerships for sustainable development from the ELISA perspective, key uh, new trends and actors present actually uh, new opportunities to unlock the full potential of geospatial data in the field and this is of course especially where no official data or there's not uh, no data with enough level of detail available so let's look at these uh, different elements we have on the slide so firstly uh, we have new geo-aware technologies as in the field of earth observation uh, which enables the provision of real-time data. So location-aware technology includes uh, sensors and methods for detecting or calculating the geographical position of a person, a mobile device, or other moving objects. So here we have to mention, of course, programs such as Copernicus and NASA, uh, who support these developments. And we'll also take a deeper look into some examples that employ such technologies later on in this webinar. Uh, secondly, and importantly, we have citizen-generated data. Um, it's increasingly important that it provides also real-time, resource-efficient data that um, in many cases still remains unexploited. So the definition given by Data for Sustainable Development is that citizen-generated data is data that people or their organizations produce to directly monitor demand or drive change on issues that affect them. 
Um, it should be mentioned, however, that citizen generated data can be active, of course, so given on a voluntary basis with a clear scope, but also passively given, so, such as through social networks. When it's actively given by citizens, however, um, it can provide direct representation of their perspectives and also an alternative to data sets collected by governments or international institutions. So as we know, such data can be generated in a number of ways, which is also one of its strengths. Um, so it can be surveys, SMS, phone calls, reports, and the list goes on. Thirdly, and naturally, we also have to mention official data providers such as governments in the UN and World Bank, who indeed remain uh, key players in the SCG data ecosystem. So wherever such data is lacking or hard to obtain, however, uh, the other sources of information that we see on this slide can uh, enrich the data available to decision makers. And this leads us to the fourth element, which is civil society initiatives who are taking indeed an increasing lead um, on using data for good. So a few examples, and we could of course mention many, are uh, first uh, data for SCDs, which was established to help stakeholders across countries and sectors really fully harness the data revolution for sustainable development using new knowledge to improve lives and, and protect the, the planet. Um, and we also have the Data for Now initiative, which is an initiative under Data for SDGs that seeks to increase the sustainable use of robust methods and tools um, that improve the timeliness, coverage, and quality of SDG data. So this is done through collaboration and partnerships, technical and capacity support, and information sharing, um, amongst others. A key element to mention as well is definitely the data for good movement. Um, it's defined by Gartner as a movement in which people and organizations transcend organizational boundaries to use data to improve society. Um, now we've seen that private and public initiatives have spread across the world as a result, um, often composed of, for example, data professionals who want to help make a positive impact and to harness um, underutilized, excuse me, data. Um, lastly, and importantly, as an initiative, we have to mention also Earth Observation for the Sustainable Development Goals, who organizes and realizes the potential of Earth Observation and Geospatial Information to directly advance the 2030 Agenda and the achievement of the SDGs. Um, and now this is done through pilot project, capacity building, data and knowledge product and outreach. Um, lastly, recently we've seen that public institutions uh, such as the UN have turned to major private companies such as Google and Alibaba to help countries reach their development goals. While these companies um, can help, particularly with geospatial data, that can be used to monitor a variety of different um, SDGs. In sum, what we'd like to convey here is that uh, there is a possibility that the ideal SDG monitoring system would draw on multiple sources of data in a very complementary way um, to leverage the comparative advantage of each of these different uh, data types. In the coming parts of this presentation, we'll explore some pertinent examples of how these trends and players have resulted in the development of real uh, geospatial solutions uh, for the SDGs. So the first, um, first example that we'd like to highlight here is the Ireland Sustainable Development Hub. Um, it's a collaboration platform for reporting on progress towards the goals. Um, and sharing information on related initiatives. Um, and it is also actually known as one of the best practices in Europe for use of geospatial data for SDG monitoring and reporting. So <clears throat> this platform was developed part of a partnership between Ordnance Survey Ireland, the Central Statistics Office and ESRI Ireland. So Ireland's progress um, against each goal is measured using, of course, a set of UN and EU agreed targets and indicators. Um, now this platform sources indicators for each of the 17 SDGs and interestingly as well, they separate between uh, geospatial and non-geospatial indicators. So 
for this uh, STD hub, <clears throat> each goal is also supported by story maps developed by ESRI um, as an effective way to visualize national progress towards STD. So as you can see here in the slide, we have one of the story maps, one of many. This is one on SDG 5 uh, on gender equality. And it shows in geographic terms the gender composition of uh, representatives in local government. So in sum, some key characteristics and success factors that we'd like to highlight about this um, example is the use of a collaborative approach to reporting and sharing data. Uh, secondly, uh, this mobilization of private and public know-how. Uh, thirdly, it's also the creation of sort of a one-stop shop for progress reports and indicator data for all SCPs. So this example really shows how at a national level, public and private actors are partnering to monitor and report on their progress uh, towards the SDGs. Now, uh, the next example we'd like to highlight is a very nice one as well. It's Hunger Map Live. This is the World Food Program's Global Hunger Monitoring System. Um, it covers 94 countries, which is quite a lot, um, and was developed by a public-private partnership between uh, WFP and Alibaba Cloud. Um, so this platform covers key metrics from uh, a long list of data sources. We can mention food security information, weather, population size, conflict, hazards, nutritional information, and uh, macroeconomic data. Uh, and all these sources are used to help assess, monitor, and predict as well the magnitude and severity of hunger in near real time through citizen generated data and AI enabled analysis. So how do they do this? The WFP conducts food security monitoring via computer assisted telephone interviewing through call centers. So as we discussed, such types of call interviews can be seen as a form of uh, citizen generated data. Um, so phone numbers are of course randomly selected uh, from a database using random digits and dialing. So the main advantage really of this approach is that data is available more frequently and processed daily as well through automated statistical engines. So the resulting analysis is displayed on an interactive map, which you can see here on the slide, um, that helps WFP staff, key decision makers, and the broader humanitarian community to make uh, more informed and timely decisions related to food security. In sum, um, this is really a nice example as it combines various data sources as developed as a public-private partnership as well, and it delivers insights on the SDGs in near real time. So our third and last example of this section is the Atlantic Water Network. Um, now, this network works to monitor the quality of open water sources in Canada, um, and quite surprisingly, perhaps for some, in 2017, a World Wildlife Fund report concluded that Canada still lacked the significant amount of environmental data required to effectively inform public policy making. So this network is a Canadian network of water monitoring organizations um, comprising of several Atlantic Canadian provinces. Um, and what's really interesting as well is that they work with diverse groups, so it ranges from entirely volunteer-led initiatives and concerned citizens to government uh, organizations with full-time staff whose daily job involves water monitoring. Um, now, all of this data is uh, published on an online platform, and here we'd really like to, to highlight the following uh, characteristics and success factors. So, First of all, there is a provision and technology, a provision of technology and guidance, excuse me, from the network provided to the participants. Secondly, um, it engages communities, which allows for a double win. So first of all, you have more data on remote areas and more citizen awareness of these environmental challenges. Um, and thirdly, uh, which is quite a bonus in this case, is the engagement of indigenous communities. Um, and this is really about integrating their knowledge into this traditional um, databases. 
So this leads us to the third section of this webinar, which is on partnering on solutions. So applying location intelligence to development. Now, um, using a broad definition as, uh, as discussed by Martina previously of location intelligence, um, one really needs to look beyond the pure business intelligence aspect and consider not only the technology, but also the inputs and outputs allowing to transform geospatial data into knowledge. Um, therefore, we uh, will use the definition of location intelligence by Del Carmen from 2016 um, in her article, What is Location Intelligence? Which is really what we're trying to highlight here. So, um, it is more than analysis of geospatial information or geographic information systems alone. It is the capability to visualize spatial data to identify and analyze relationships. Now, interestingly, a 2013 publication from Deloitte um, also discusses the power of location intelligence or so-called zooming in, and it finds key, uh, three key steps which should apply to all data intelligence initiatives. So here, we're talking about, first of all, to collect. Um, collect the location-based data already available and integrate location intelligence into employee decision-making. So here we see it's really about using location intelligence for statistics and development of baseline scenarios and planning. The second step is connect. Um, here we're talking about connecting with external partners and data sources that support mission priorities. So here again, we have this whole element of working in partnership and through data ecosystems. Lastly, it's about uh, protecting citizens and employees. Uh, we, do, we can do this by understanding the privacy issues related to location-based data and focus on delivering value in exchange for sharing location information. So all these steps are clearly very relevant in the context of data ecosystem initiative or location intelligence. Um, now I'd just like to say also to please note that the question of data protection is of course um, in incredibly important um, and therefore it would actually deserve a separate discussion. So we will only touch upon it very lightly in this presentation. Uh, and importantly, the European Parliament has also recently issued a briefing on the location tracking measures taken by um, about half of the EU member states uh, recently in light of the COVID-19 pandemic and the related privacy issues. So this really takes us into the first um, example or set of examples that we'd like to highlight. And that is the rapid uptake of uh, geospatial enabled solutions for accurate and real time management of the current COVID 19 pandemic. Um, it's indeed a key trend to mention at this point. So, these examples that we've gathered are based on really methodologies of spatial thinking, which is the basis of location intelligence, and it draws insight from human mobility. So there are, of course, many initiatives that we could have highlighted for the purpose of time. We'll mention three. Um, so firstly, we have the COVID-19 uh, mobility monitoring project, which was carried out through a data collective between ISI Foundation and Cubic Inc. So this project analyzes anonymized location data to understand the effect of mobility restrictions and behavioral changes on the current international COVID-19 outbreak. So in terms of data, mobility data is provided by Cubic um, and location is then collected anonymously from opt-in users through smartphone applications. At the device level, operating systems combine various location data sources, so we're talking GPS, Wi-Fi networks, and provide geographical coordinates with a given level of accuracy. Now, we've um, put in a little symbol of SDG3, good health and well-being. So how does this contribute to SDG3? Um, we would say that the average contact rate or the number of unique contacts made by a person on a typical day is fundamental quantity to model and understand infectious disease dynamics such as COVID-19. So it's an important contribution in that sense. So the second example we'd like to highlight is the social distancing scoreboard. 
It's an interactive scoreboard developed by private company Unicast, uh, which is updated daily to inform and empower organizations to make better decisions regarding um, social distancing. So the scoring methodology is based on percent change in average distance traveled, uh, percent change uh, change in non-essential visitation, and decrease in encounter density compared to national baseline. So the rationale behind this initiative is that indeed in many rural places and other less populated areas, the baseline for social distancing is of course much lower and thus it is um, slightly inaccurate to apply the same standards to places that have drastically less potential to decrease. So since uh, Unicast data can't detect the two humans are actually met, they instead use data to simulate potential encounters and derive the probability that two devices that were in the same place um, at the same time. So contributing to SDB3 as well in the sense that the model can help governments and local municipalities enact public health policies specific to their um, demographic context. So lastly, we'd like to mention ShopPlay. Um, and there are many other similar applications like it, which is an app uh, that aids shoppers in keeping social distance and tracking the availability of products in supermarkets based on citizen-generated data and location data provided by telecom operators. So the telecom operators will give the company behind the app the number of active phones near a given supermarket every five minutes and encourages users to provide input on product availability and crowding in their local stores while visiting. So this as well contributes to SCP3 by mobilizing citizens to take an active part in disease prevention. Now our next example for this section is One Soil. Um, it's a Belarus-based agriculture startup create, who created an interactive map that allows you to explore and compare fields and crops in Europe and the US. So by using Copernicus Sentinel data, this platform um, allows the user to explore fields and see the hectares, the crop and the field score, as well as making global comparisons. So this uh, was enabled by applying technology to analyze satellite imagery using a machine learning algorithm and then of course cleaning the satellite photos from artifacts to ensure the correct processing of information. So then um, this company trained the algorithms to allocate field boundaries automatically. <clears throat> so the value of this <clears throat> excuse me type of, of map is that it reveals the insights about local and global trends in crop production. Um, secondly, it also helps to predict market performance at all levels. And thirdly, it can be used to inform decision making. So as is stressed by SDB 12 on responsible consumption and production, free open source initiatives such as uh, the analytics that could potentially be provided by by um, solutions such as one soil may foster policies that improve resource efficiency, reduce waste, and mainstream sustainability practices across the agricultural sector. So, our last example of this section is Ocean Cleanup, which is quite a well known engineering environmental organization um, and nonprofit foundation based in the Netherlands um, that helps develop technology to extract plastic pollution from the oceans. Now, as we are all aware, every year um, millions of tons of plastic enters the ocean primarily from rivers. So therefore solving um, ocean plastic pollution requires a combination of stemming the inflow and cleaning up what's already been accumulated, excuse me, which is what uh, really this organization uh, works to tackle. Now, um, their maps that you can see in this slide um, have been developed in cooperation with the private company Mapbox and with findings from a cooperation with Deloitte. And it visualizes, first of all, as you can see, the larger map, the most polluting rivers in the world. And second of all, as you have an example of with the smaller map here, it also gives insight to national costs of plastic production per country, plastic pollution, excuse me. 
So this system um, can also predict how much plastic has been disposed in rivers and oceans from the moment you enter the platform, which is also quite an interesting feature. What we'd say here is that this new uh, model approach behind the map includes geographically distributed data on plastic waste, land use, wind, precipitation, and rivers, and calculates the probability for plastic waste to reach a river and subsequently the ocean. Um, and it highlights regions that are likely to emit plastic into the ocean. Combining this with mismanaged plastic waste displayed on this map, the model predicts plastic emissions for each river. So um, it's important to mention before we move on that the findings displayed in this map are currently under review for scientific publication. Um, however, the results, once verified, can certainly assist in prioritizing, developing, and implementing um, mitigation measures and strategies for plastic pollution. So that leads us to the fourth section of this uh, presentation, and I'll give the floor back to Martina. Thank you very much, Flea. So you have seen all these examples of what data ecosystem and location intelligence uh, means in practice in the context of SDG. And what we would like to suggest, or, and we tried to suggest all through this webinar, is that geospatial data and location intelligence, far from playing a role only in monitoring and reporting about SDG, can also play a role in their effective delivery. So, for instance, data ecosystem are a way to untap this geospatial potential and collect data from non-traditional sources, thus making them more relevant. And location intelligence is a way to transform uh, this, uh, the, the input coming from these different data into a smarter, uh, more sustainable and better sustainable development policies. Nonetheless, to exploit this potential for the spatial for development, uh, there are some efforts uh, and some investments that need to be made or continued. So, for instance, uh, it's important to continue to increase the awareness of key stakeholders about the advantages of sharing data. So, this question of awareness comes back quite often, and uh, the fact is that um, data sharing is also a mindset that needs to be fostered. Then there is the question of sustainability and institutionalization of data partnerships and ecosystem. So the fact is, right now, there are many data ecosystems that are being established, uh, but this needs to be continued and need to be stabilized for them to be really able to uh, help in the context of SDG. Uh, so the question of sustainability is pivotal, and what is also pivotal is to ensure that the governance and functioning of this data ecosystem is, is flexible enough to be adapted to different local circumstances. Uh, so there, is a need, there needs uh, to be a degree of flexibility and customization for data ecosystem to be fit for purpose in different contexts. And finally, uh, the, uh, well, using geospatial needs, uh, needs a lot of capacity building efforts uh, for stakeholders to really be able to exploit this potential. This leads us to some key takeaways from, from today's uh, webinar. Uh, so this is just some initial concluding remarks. Uh, but we would like to leave you on, on with, with these key messages. Uh, first of all, that new trends around geospatial, such as the use of Earth observation or big data and AI, can strengthen the role uh, of geospatial in the context of SDG and beyond monitoring and statistical purposes only. And in this context, if we look at geospatial from this perspective, then uh, data ecosystem and location intelligence are becoming more and more relevant. There is a lot of literature already focusing on data ecosystem, uh, while maybe location intelligence in practice is slightly less explored. Uh, but in, from this perspective, it's important to agree on a commonly understood definition of location intelligence so that this aspect can be further researched on in the future. And on this note, I would like to uh, give the floor back to Lorena. Thank you, Martina and Lea, for the presentation. Before closing the presentation, and in addition to all what uh, has already been mentioned, um, if Elisa is somehow contributing to the SDGs, this is clearly through the development of frameworks and tools that promote interoperability and also the efficiency of location data sharing among organizations. And in this sense, today we wanted to, to bring uh, and to highlight one of our ongoing activities, is the Elisa Energy Location and Applications. Uh, this activity has two main goals. Uh, first is to leverage the use and exchange of inspired harmonized location-based data at building level. And secondly, to scale up the methodologies to assess the energy consumption and performance of building, of building sorry, from local to national level, as required by the, by the energy efficiency related to the European directives. You can get more information on the outputs of this activity in the Join Up dedicated page that appears in the slide shown. 
And uh, this takes us to the end of the webinar. Uh, I invite you to follow us uh, on our social networks to stay up to date with the upcoming events. And with this, I want to thank you again for participating and uh, we wish you to see you again. Thank you.